Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for our digital Q&A with Shirley Jha. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you on the traditional lands of the Ghana people, and I recognise the connection to this um, land, waters and skies, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I'd like to um, extend my respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders um, people today, and also acknowledge um, the uh, traditional um, owners of all the lands of the people that are that, of the people joining us today. So my name is Tash. I'm a space communicator at the Australian Space Discovery Centre here in Adelaide, and I'm assisted behind the scenes by Nate Taylor, our produ producer today. If you have any questions for Shirley, um, please submit them via the Teams Q&A function. I'll, we'll ask them mainly at the end, once we're uh, sort of in, wrapping up, um, but if they're, if they're super relevant to the conversation, I might bring them up and ask them um, immediately and pass them on to Shirley. Finally, um, as housekeeping, our session will be wrapping up at 2.45 Australian Central Standard Time today, uh, but we invite you to visit the Australian Space Discovery Centre if you have more questions about the Australian Space Agency. Otherwise, um, you can also drop us a line via the contact details on our website. So our, our guest today is Shirley Junk. Um, so Shirley, um, tell us about yourself. Uh, hello, I am Shirley Zhang. I'm currently in the Canberra office, the traditional lands of Nunao people. Uh, I am Australian Space Agency's Defence Interfacing Engineer who manages the technical partnership between the Australian Space Agency and Defence. I'm also a satellite system engineer specialising in ground system. Uh, and um, here is my personal PPT, just a little bit uh, overview of who I am. Uh, if you could move to the first page. Thanks, Tash. Um, this is the beginning of everything. I was born in a small city in China called Handan. My childhood was full of anime and novels. I was also a Taekwondo kid. My dad was a big gamer and I became one too. Um, as a child, the space theme was not even a futuristic science fiction to me. It was pure fantasy. All those wormhole travels, major time drifting in space, or building a new civilization on another planet are all very fascinating but obscure. And moving on to the next page, my family moved to uh, Melbourne in my teen years. I completed high school and undergrad in Melbourne. It was quite difficult to settle at first, learning a new language and fitting into a new culture. I'm very grateful that I've made good friends at school who motivated me to use English more to share my life and hobbies. I did a double degree at RMIT University in computer science and network engineering. Uh, at school, I was the game uh, manga anime club vice president before going to Germany. So lots of fan fiction writing, cosplaying and game and pizza nights. Uh, my biggest hobbies on top of anime and games were aerobatic dancing and traveling. Um, so growing up, I knew I would never be an astrophysicist or um, a scientist. That's why space is still fascinating, but too distant to me because it's in the high sci scientific space um, in the back of my head. I've never thought of I will be working in space. Um, and next page is um, in my early 20s, I moved to Nuremberg to work. It is a city near Munich in Germany to learn the German engineering process. It was very difficult to learn another new language and another new culture, but with all the cool people you meet, the fantastic music festivals in uh, Berlin, in Amsterdam, and the adventures in different countries, it was worth it. Um, something I miss the most about Europe is the cheap and convenient travels. Uh, and uh, one thing about German engineering culture I really loved was that most companies offered free beer and sausages every Friday at work and lots of laser tag gatherings too. Um, 
so the next page summarizes uh, a bit of my career path uh, in my first in space. Um, so in my first year of uni, the Australian Defence Force came to RMIT to promote the grad programs. I emailed them to ask about the internship opportunities for early year students. No internship was offered at the time, but they asked me to send my CV through. Uh, I then prepared my first CV and being a first year of uni students, I had absolutely no industry experience. Um, instead, I did my research on the existing defense capabilities on their homepage and uh, wrote my current study, my passion, what I think I can possibly work on. So pretty much a beta version of API selection criteria if you have applied for APS roles before. <laughs> so a few months later, when Defense opened its first work experience program, I was offered a position in the Land System Engineering Division in Victoria Barracks. The work was focused on the procurement and maintenance of the capability used for Army operations. Uh, I worked on the communication devices like radios or wearable device, uh, computers and also communication on vehicles to figure out how can we provide secure and fast communication for warfighters. It is actually a perfect use case for being a consumer or end user of the space technology the vehicles or the comm devices in such deployed setting will connect to the communication satellites with via the antenna installed on them and the satellite uh, after it receives the signals will transmit to another user that that way they can talk to each other communicate with each other um, then Germany and after coming back from Germany, I took on the role of satellite system engineer in Defense Satellite Operations Center in 2018. The op center is similar to the picture here. Uh, my major role was a uh, transponder planner and um, frequency band analyst. analyst, analyst. <laughs> uh, so in a nutshell, we have uh, limited resources in the sense of radio frequencies when an end user such as the vehicle in the first picture wants to communicate via our satellites we need to uh, prioritize them carefully plan the usages of the resources we have and then allocate them with suitable amount and type of resources. And this process is very complicated. So we do it together with the Australian Communication and Media Authority, ACMA. And then shifted from defense setups to the Bureau of Meteorology setups. Uh, the major difference was from communication use of satellite to Earth observation. I managed the uh, meteorol uh, meteorological Earth observation satellite systems and the ground stations across Australia and Antarctica. So there are three Australian Antarctic weather stations being Davis, Casey and Molson. Um, that summarizes the early stage or operational stage of my career. Good. Thank you so much for sort of you've you've had like quite a few jobs and you uh, explained them quite well um, for the amount of stuff that you had to cover. So I was wondering if you could sort of expand a little bit. You started with military or defense satellites and then went on to more civil, civil um, satellites. What's the main difference between them? Um, there are two different uses um, of satellites, especially in terms of um, meteorological or scientific use and defense use. Um, sorry, if you could uh, go back to the previous page, I had a, a diagram to explain if you can see the Earth has three different uh, ranges of satellites being Geo, Mio and Leo. Am I just explain how satellite works first and then go through the differences of use. Um, when we uh, fall a um, rotating object, there are two major forces being involved. One is the centrifugal 
meaning the force pushes the object away from the center and when it's a uh, centripetal which pulls the object in to the center. Um, the faster you rotate, you create stronger centrifugal. And if you rotate it too fast, then the object flies away because uh, the centrifugal being too too big. And if uh, you don't rotate it fast enough, then it's being put back to the center. So to make a uh, an object stay at the same distance to perform rotation, you need the right around uh, amount of push and pull. And in a satellite context, um, satellites being uh, having Earth gravity as the uh, centripetal is pu keep pulling the satellites in. And if you set the satellites to a specific speed which balances that pull, um, it will just starting to orbit around Earth. So uh, theoretically, you can put the satellite at any distance. Obviously, there's a uh, limit for how close you can put it uh, to perform one orbit. Uh, as long as it's bigger than that limit, you can put it at any distance. Just need the right amount of speed to create enough centrifugal to balance it. Um, and also, like when satellite is closer to Earth, it's faster. That's why um, all the Earth observation satellites are faster, and when it's uh, further away from the Earth, it's uh, slower because the gravity pull is weaker. You don't need that uh, fast. And another thing is space is a vacuum setting, meaning that ideally no other force will affect its speed. Once the rocket carries the satellites and sets its speed, the satellite will keep its speed after detaching from the rocket. Um, so that's just um, how satellite works, that we can actually put object around the Earth to perform uh, orbits or rota rotations. And um, in 1929, Austria-Hungarian Austria engineer Hermann Potocink worked out this perfect distance, roughly 36k kilometers, which takes one sidereal day to complete one orbit, meaning that it's in sync with the Earth rotation. Um, any, so it moves as the Earth moves, and any object on that orbit will appear fixed or stationary on Earth. That's why uh, it's called geostationary orbit and any satellites or anything on that orbit is called geostationary uh, satellites. But that's 1929, not many things could happen yet. Uh, with the technological improvements on Earth in 1945, the author of 2001 A Space Odyssey, British science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke proposed the first practical use case of this orbit, which is a satellite communication system. Um, when we put a satellite on that geostationary uh, orbit, so the satellite being geostationary basically means when you install an antenna to point to it to transmit and receive data, the antenna doesn't need reorientation because you know exactly where the satellite is, which is perfect for telecommunications, TV signals, and weather monitoring. And that's where our Foxtel, NBN, um, and also Himawari 8, the Japanese weather satellite that uh, Bureau of Meteorology uses. Um, and another fun fact, because uh, Arthur uh, proposed the satellite, that's why the geo orbit is also called the clock orbit, and the collection of artificial satellites in this orbit is called the clock belt. But from the diagram, you can see that geo uh, giving this fantastic coverage, but it's so far away from Earth, meaning that it's not ideal when you want to monitor whatever is happening on Earth. Therefore, LEO is used. So low, low Earth orbit satellites are being used to do um, Earth observation. 
uh, even though it's not stationary to us and has much smaller coverage, it has much lower latency being so close to Earth and also higher spatial resolution of data. Um, it might be used for special communications like human space flight, but it's um, ideal for Earth observation to collect Earth data. And there's something in between called MEO, the Middle Earth Orbit. Um, it's not the best for communication, also not close enough to take pictures of uh, Earth properly, but it's really good for navigation. That's why most of the GPS are on uh, MEO orbits. And it's also good for uh, space environment to monitor the space environment. Um, I guess uh, this is just some satellite 101 of different types of satellites and in defense. Um, like I mentioned, it's a SATCOM user, meaning that uh, their satellites are geo satellites. Um, performing most of the work is uh, relating to how to provide communication, how to plan those communications. And uh, for a scientific institution like the Bureau of Meteorology or Geoscience Australia, or CERO, they their use of satellites are more LEO satellite to um, collect data of the Earth and analyze those data. So that's the major difference between the usage of um, a different satellite and um, uh, meteorological satellites or scientific satellites. Thank you so much. Thank you for giving that sort of satellite 101. I think that was super be beneficial for, for the audience and um, to give a little bit of context <laughs> about the rest of the questions. Um, so did you find, given that military satellites seem to be like quite a lot further out, was it a lot more challenging doing the communication for those or was there much of a difference between um, communication with a geosynchronous satellite and a LEO satellite? A lower um, so it depends on the context. Um, like I said, the um, geo satellite are designed, uh, especially in a defense context, is just pure communication satellites. That's what uh, that means. The communication, the management of the radio frequencies is uh, the most important things. Um, and being a LEO satellite, because you don't really use it to communicate, you don't really need to worry about the uh, radio frequency part of the things, um, except when you're launching it. Obviously, you need to work with ECMA to um, set it once and after um, giving it a uh, channel to be able to communicate with the satellite uh, directly to do maneuver or check on the satellite, you don't really need to worry about the radio frequencies anymore. It's more about how to capture those data, how to download those data and how to uh, process them afterwards and distribute them. Right, thank you. Awesome. So I think you have another slide that covers sort of where you're at now. Yeah, sure. Um, so um, like I said before, being a quite mature satellite user, the Australian government had many ground stations and operation centers, but we don't have our own sovereign satellite system especially lack of development in the space segment. For example, there's no spacecraft built specifically for Australian Defence SATCOM or Australian weather. We're currently using commercial and international partnership solutions. Um, that's why most of the jobs in satellite engineering in Australia at the moment are offered to communication engineers to work in the ground segment. When Defence started to look into the next generation of the SATCOM system, I was offered the ground and control segment lead role in the future SATCOM branch to deliver the first sovereign SATCOM capabilities. Uh, it is a very exciting journey to be involved in drafting the operations concept for a complete satellite system, not only the ground, even I was looking at uh, the ground part, but I learned so much about the space segment too. 
Uh, I then took the Australian Space Agency's opportunity this July as a uh, defense interfacing engineer. Um, you probably have noticed that different Australian government agencies had their own had many use cases in space technologies. However, prior to the formation of the space agency, they all started their space journey separately because there's no one agency coordinate everything. Uh, some projects had a partnership with each other and some haven't been communicated yet. My role is to look at the space related use case from Australian government as one entity. Uh, I am focusing on one of the most experienced Australian space user defense and whether defense use case will overlap with other agencies. Um, I'll also be looking at uh, what's ACMA is doing or what, what is Geoscience Australia or CERO is doing just to find the similarities and to find opportunities to work together with defense. Um, hopefully we can create a collaborative environment to efficiently grow the Australian space industry together. Wow, so it looks like you started like quite very technical and uh, that's really demonstrated by your really strong understanding uh, but now your role is very focused on sort of collaboration and organization so you kind of need the technical background but also need soft skills which is really impressive what kind of soft skills do you think you need for your role right now um being a more strategic level of the roles, uh, you definitely, uh, it's an engagement role first of all, so you don't need to talk to people, um, but having that uh, deep understanding uh, of what other agencies or uh, the space technologies had been going on in Australia definitely helps with the conversation. And another really good um, soft uh, skills that I think everyone should have at a workplace is teamwork. Um, having that mindset of uh, all of the work can be um, worked out more efficiently when we collaborate with others, regardless if it's your own team or with other agencies or with the industry. Um, if you have that mindset of doing teamwork and build things together, um, we will be achieving results faster. Um, it, thanks, so this is my last page that I have made for graduates specifically, because I know some of the uh, students are graduating soon, are graduating now, they um, might want to apply for a job at the space agency or um, Australian Public Service. If you do apply for APS role, there's a big chance that you will be coming to Canberra for at least one rotation. So prepare for the real cold. It has awesome snow trips, but really cold. Uh, it will have lots of fancy events that doesn't normally happen in other states. For example, the military or depart um, government balls or diplomat gatherings because they want to make friends. Lots of food and drink festivals uh, like Floriad and um, being surrounded by mountains and farms, you can meet lots of nature and uh, animals. Uh, they have really cool indie and indie galleries and art workshops, if that's your thing, and really good sport and hobby communities. Uh, try something new. Um, and if you go to the Canberra social page on Facebook, you will see people asking to go hacking or play board game together every week. So it's very popular here and I'm hosting the Madness of uh, Mansion of Madness at the moment. If you do visit Canberra, definitely come to the Canberra Deep Space Communication Complex. It is a NASA Deep Space Center which is managed by CERO at the moment. If you are familiar with the movie The Dish, you probably know that that dish is in our Honeysuckle Creek Track Center, which is combined with the uh, Deep Space Center at the, uh, right now. Uh, so our Honeysuckle Creek dish received and broadcasted the first eight minutes of Apollo 11's moon landing. So way Australian captured Neil Armstrong's first step. 
uh, if you want to know more about the stars be behind uh, this event and what actually happened, what are the differences between real life and the movie, you should definitely visit them in Timimbela and ask away. I'm sure they will be more than happy to tell you more about it. Yep, so that's that summarizes my own uh, presentation for uh, everyone, especially the students. Good to know you. Uh, I look forward to meet you in the future space journey. Thank you so much. Actually, while we're talking about sort of future um, or students who might be watching, do you have any specific advice for someone who's inspired by your career? What sort of advice would you have? Um, for sure. So I do have uh, two major advices. One is be proactive and do your research. So um, if you remember when I talked about my first uh, opportunity working at Defense is ADF coming to promote another program and I, I was really keen to get on more industry experience. So I went to ask them first, uh, ask their email and um, also do your research so I didn't just um, give them a CV with nothing. I did uh, uh, do a lot of research before kind of applying for uh, the experience and also uh, it also works for APS because when you are writing your selection criteria, um, better to write um, more uh, in detail because people do rate them. Um, and if you can explain why you want to do this role and your experience in detail, you will be standing out. Um, so another way of being proactive, especially if you do want to work in the space industry, um, definitely visit our Australian Discover, uh, Discover, Space Discovery Centre and um, also follow whatever is going on with the space agency, watch videos from other guests who work in the industry because all of us have our unique journey and stories. Um, yeah, uh, uh, sorry. So that's the first advice. And the second one would be um, when I think back to my younger self, um, I would tell her just don't be af afraid of making mistakes. It's never too late to change or start something new because you have your whole life to enjoy uh, this journey and everything happens. Doesn't matter if you change directions or not. It's a part of the adventure of your life. So um, don't stress if you don't get something right away or you don't get a space agency role as your first graduation role. You if you do like this industry, there will be opportunities and um, works coming. Yeah, I mean, space is full of failures, so you, ha you really have to be resilient. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I guess to sort of segue to um, sort of Australia in space, you've definitely traveled around um, growing up in China and then um, going to Nuremberg and all that. I was wondering, what sort of makes Australia unique in its sort of space, in the space industry? Um, I think Australia, oh, well, when, when we talk in a scientific uh, perspective, the location is very unique because it's close to Antarctica. Uh, not many uh, satellite involved projects had been done in Antarctica yet just because they're too far away. Um, if we can grow our industry, um, maybe in the future focusing on some some sort of researchers in uh, Antarctica, that would be really cool. And another thing is um, we have really good international partnership, even though we don't have our own spacecraft designed for our government needs. Uh, we work with other nations, so we already built, we already have a good grounding in uh, relation of uh, building that partnership and um, we, might, we, we have also used many other nations uh, spacecraft and build our own uh, ground stations to receive uh, signals from those or data or signals from those uh, other nations spacecraft. Uh, therefore, we're quite experienced in ground segment. 
um, I think having this advantages, uh, if we do grow our industry, it will be uh, a lot easier and hopefully one day we can starting to provide services to uh, other nations too. Yeah, that was actually my next question of was going to be like, what do you see the future of Australia space industry? I guess you talked about having our own SATCOM system. That would be part of our ideal future of Australia, of the Australian space industry. What else would you imagine or hope for? Um, I think the first thing relating to my role is definitely uh, one well communicated government space entity. Um, and working as a team to build a collaborative space industry. And the second thing is more sovereign capabilities um, to support Australian needs. Um, and the uh, a third one would be uh, having you know, a good government and industry and also having more sovereign capabilities coming. We will build a bigger Australian space industry with more job opportunities and varieties, especially from, for the younger audience. Uh, one day they will be building the spacecraft and maybe do space travel or even build on another planet. So when I was, like I said, when I was a kid, this are all fantasy to me, but I can definitely see it happen um, to the younger generation. Yeah, and a lot of the, the things you've mentioned are sort of part of the Australian Space Agency sort of goals, not in the near future as well. It's not a far future thing, so that's really exciting. Um, I thought I'd move on to some of the Q&A questions. You, you've actually got a couple like quite technical questions that um, I'm pretty um, happy with. So one of them was sort of how do meteorological satellite operations work across time zones? Did your team sort of work with international teams? Um, so the meteorological satellites in a uh, operate, so there are two types. One is using Leo, sorry, one is using Geo, like the weather satellites, uh, the Himawari 8 um, in the Japanese, sorry, the Japanese Himawari 8 weather satellites. Um, we don't really manage them in the Bureau of Meteorology. We just use their data. But uh, for LEO satellite, uh, for the things that uh, Bureau of Meteorology actually supports, uh, we just need to capture their data. So obviously when we do capture their data, there will be communications back and forth um, from the spacecraft uh, providers or within the user community because there will be lots of people. So um, going back to what Leo is, it's uh, not stationary. That's why it just changes its direction all the time, maybe across the ocean um, to other sides of the Earth. Um, if that happens, then we are not the only ground station capturing those data. It's uh, different countries and different communities capturing the same satellite data and uh, then we kind of um, compare or use them together to analyze a more detailed uh, result, uh, sorry, um, report of those data. So um, I don't know if that answers the question because uh, for geo satellite, we don't operate them and for Leo satellite, we just capture their data from Australia and maybe compare those data with or um, share those data with other countries and they will be capturing when satellite that passes their country too. Yeah, I think I think that answered the question. Um, another question that I think you sort of we have touched on this, but might be worth reiterating is um, a lot of work seems to be um, with the downstream ground segment and capabilities. Is there much interfacing with the upstream space segment happening in Australia? or is most of the focus currently on end user applications? Um, there will be people, so in an Australian sense, um, there will be um, like satellite players like Optus or Telstra, um, obviously their commercial use of satellite. But uh, when I talk about not many things are going on, in the state segment, I'm more um, talking about in a government sense because that's where I'm more familiar with. Um, and if we're talking about Australian space in um, 
Australian government space capabilities, then um, no, there are not much uh, going on on the spacecraft. Uh, in in a sense of downlink and uplink, obviously we need to uh, receive and transmit signals to the um, satellites. That's why we have our own payload on other people's satellite. But um, those satellites themselves are not designed for our use. Uh, if that makes sense. So we do have a control in terms of uplink and downlink transmitting signals or transmitting data, but we don't um, have our own spacecraft designed specifically for our Australian government use. Yeah, I guess that comes back to sort of the sovereign capability that we're yeah. mentioning. Um, another question we got was, what is your favourite career moment? Um, I'll have to say it's now, <laughs> otherwise I probably wouldn't have um, taken this role because they're all quite exciting um, experiences, but the current role, because coming from a pure technical background, uh, I have never really done a, an engagement role in the past. Uh, it's a learning curve, definitely. I'm more comfortable with the technical side of the work. However, um, being able to involved in this uh, space agency program and being able to interface with Defence and all the other uh, satellite users from Australia, it's uh, it's just very exciting and lots of things to learn because uh, before, even though I worked with Defence and Bureau of Meteorology and um, ECMA because Defence worked closely with ECMA, uh, I don't really know what CERO does. I don't really know what Geoscience Australia does. And now um, being in this role, I have to communicate with their satellite team all the time and uh, hopefully in the future discovering uh, even more use cases and uh, bring them all together. That will be very exciting. Yeah, but actually um, we've got another question which are related to ACMA and it's about your experience with the provision of Earth observation downlink. So like how, how difficult is that to manage given if Australia maybe there's less competition or is it still pretty tough to manage that? Um, it's definitely very difficult to manage because um, uh, defense uh, satellite usage, even for defense, we don't uh, allocate our own frequency directly. We need approval from ECMA. So lots of the work have to work together with ECMA. And when we talk about defense, because um, even though defense is important, it shouldn't be, uh, it doesn't mean other uses, usages are not important. That's why we have to cooperate and coordinate with civilian uses. Um, and co uh, coordinating that, uh, calculating those link budgets and to find the best way of locating those resources is very uh, complicated and um, I'm glad that ECMA is uh, taking care of most of the spectrum allocation jobs. I had sort of a more, um, I noticed a lot of your books were very like techie but also sort of ethical, very sort of um, stuff like Brave New World, Flowers of Algonon, sort of futuristic, but also thinking about ethics, which I, I also love it, those types of books. And I was wondering um, what sort of um, do you see as the benefits of space? Like what sort of, as someone who seems to be interested in ethics and the future, um, what do you see space allowing humans to do? Um. I think uh, from a pure fantasy point of view, <laughs> reading so much uh, dystopian novels, uh, I do think um, there are two things might happen. One is we fix the Earth and another one is we have to move away from the Earth eventually if we want to survive, but that's like far future. Um, 
being able to work in space, if we do get a uh, really good, for example, uh, Earth observation data in a space sense of uh, using artificial satellites, monitor and collect data from our planet Earth, we might be able to use those data, for example, the soil moisture, the ozone layer, air quality, using those data to um, monitor the climate change and manage our resources, especially non-renewable resources like uh, mineral and also supporting uh, farmers or uh, growing more trees maybe. Um, all this kind of things that helping Earth um, but at the same time, there will, will be another team in space uh, looking at building capabilities on the moon or Mars eventually. Who knows? <laughs> so um, definitely lots of things are going on uh, in space at the moment. And what do you think are the biggest risks of sort of our technological space expansion? What do we have to be wary about when we think of ethics? Um, so I'm not a uh, professional like space lawyer. There, there are actually lots of space lawyer. We have space lawyer in space agency as well. But uh, listening to their stories, I can only um, tell what I know about ethics. One is definitely the usage because um, uh, like more practically, especially in the LEO space, because you can see for geo satellites, it's so far away, you don't need many of them. But for LEO satellite, it only covers a small uh, part. That's why the space is actually very congested now. Being congested, uh, a risk is that um, if one satellite goes wrong, it might become debris, it might become like space drunk and hit other satellites. So have to be mindful in terms of uh, flying, launching your satellite. And uh, from a more futuristic view, if we do start to um, put our uh, civilization or building things on another planet, then um, is it going to be for humans or any human can can go there or is it going to be climbed by some nations um, that should be really mindful and I'm pretty sure there are lots of space treaties uh, from the space law uh, covering that at the moment. Yeah, so yeah, you're right, there are space lawyers at the Australian Space Agency are working on that. I guess I have one more and this one's more of a fun one, or, or maybe not fun. Do you think that we will find um, aliens in the next 10 years? Or when do you think we'll find aliens? Um, we don't really talk about it. <laughs> um, I honestly don't know. I haven't seen one yet, but they might exist. They might not. Uh, we have only seen 5% of the universe. The, the other 45, 95% uh, my math, 95% uh, are just dark materials and dark energies. So um, they might be um, alien in some sense, but they might not be anything. Anything could happen. Awesome. Um, so that is all the time we have today. Thank you so much for um, joining us and talking about your journey and also giving us a crash course on satellites and some of their uses. That was really valuable. Thank you, Shirley. Um, Thank you, and Tash. if you'd like to learn more about space in Australia or how to become a space expert, um, come visit us at the Australian Space Discovery Centre and we can talk a little bit about the Australian Space Agency and some of the career pathways for you. So thank you so much. <laughs>